Hello, friends, and welcome once again to our series entitled Last Day Events. We thank you for tuning in again, for taking the time tonight to sit down and invite your friends and family to watch and to listen to this program, whether by television, whether internet, whatever means you're looking through. We thank you that you've taken the time, and we hope you have your Bibles. If you're joining us on the radio, we pray that you'll keep it tuned into the station because tonight we have a very important topic. It is entitled The Final Coalition. We began a few nights ago with the message entitled The Final Countdown. Then last night, The Final Stage. Tonight, The Final Coalition. And on tomorrow, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, we call it the Sabbath. The message is The Final Apostasy, 11 a.m. Central Time. And then tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Central Time, the last message entitled The Final Act. We would like you to stay in an attitude of prayer. This is a very powerful message tonight, and I want to communicate it the way that God intends for it to be communicated, but I don't want you to take it personal. I believe that the Lord has many sincere Christians that are looking for salvation, and many are walking where God does not intend for them to walk. I mentioned last night that many of the last day signs are happening in the church. The devil already has the world. So tonight, as we pray, we will ask the Lord to open our hearts and our eyes to hear what he has to say to his people and to those who need to find out his truth and to accept him as their Savior. Let's bow our heads together. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you again. As we open the word, we pray that we'll also open our hearts and our minds and our ears. We pray that you'll keep back the enemy from hindering this message from going forward in a very powerful way. Lord, I give you my heart and my hand and take this word, take the scriptures and make it the living word that someone who's looking for truth will find it and they will also find a relationship with Christ. In your precious name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, you may want to turn with me. If you don't have your Bibles, you know that we've been faithful to put the text on the screen one of the most significant Bible verses in the Bible. You know, when I was raised and I played sports in high school, I once played football. You can tell I'm not built for that sport. I want to tell you I just played two games, and after getting hit in the head, I thought, you know, there's got to be another way to live. So I took up basketball, and that has not been good to me. All my injuries have been from basketball. Broken leg, almost lost my eye, broke my face in three places, almost lost my voice. Didn't get a penny for any of that. But something that sticks out in my mind is this. Whenever the game began, the coach always said to us, forget that cliché. And we would say, what cliché? And it is this one. It is not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game. He said, that does not apply to this game. You better win. We have not trained you to play a game. You better win. And brothers and sisters, we are in a battle. This is not a game we play. Christianity is a whether you win or lose situation. So this text tonight takes us right into the focus of not a game that Christ is playing, not a game that Satan is playing, but in fact, it is whether or not we win or lose. To encourage you, Jesus has already won. Can you say amen to that? So we have to join the winning side if we plan on being on that eternal field where joy and peace will last forever. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. I'm going to speak quickly tonight. I have a lot to cover. The Bible says, And the dragon, that is Satan, was enraged with the woman, that is the church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the remnant of her seed. And who are they? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Friends, let me make a statement that's very, very clear. We are definitely living in the last days. I believe that with all my heart. The final coalition against truth will soon be formed. We are on the brink of the battle of Armageddon. And every system that has ever opposed the government of God is going to be represented in the battle of Armageddon. That's also the final coalition. The Bible has prophesied it. We have preached about it. And we have seen steps being made to bring this text to its grand fulfillment. While this is not solely the last day verse, the last days bring this verse to its fruition, to its strength, to its fulfillment. We are living in the most intense time of the assault, and this is the last days. The largest and most coordinated attack, according to this text, 
is going to be the last days. But to fully understand what this text means, there are five things we must understand. How many things did I say? Five. Here they are. One, who is the warrior in this text? Secondly, who is the intended victim? Thirdly, what is the reason for the attack? Fourth, what is the arsenal used in the attack? And last, how will we know that the final attack is imminent? How will we know that we're living at the time of the final attack? The final play of the game, the last 10 seconds, as I talked about a few nights ago. First, let's look at the first recorded attack, the first war that took place. Revelation 12, verse 7 and 8, and it reads as follows. And war broke out where? In heaven. Michael, who is Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon, that is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought. I don't know if you catch that. It says that there was even disharmony among the dragon and his angels. There is not unity. There is not a unified coalition among the fallen angels. A any more than there is a unified coalition in our world. Wherever there is sin, there is not unity. But it goes on. But they did not prevail. Can we say amen to that? They didn't win. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. That means when we get to heaven, Satan and his angels won't be there. It's going to be a place without sin. Sin will never, ever have a chance, never have an opportunity to rise up a second time. Nahum 1.9 says, Affliction will not rise up a second time. Sin and sinners will be no more. The one pushing sin will never exist again. So there will never, ever be an opportunity, even in our choices, to sin. The reason clearly is we will be made in the complete image of Christ, fully righteous. And when the Bible says we are righteous, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Forever sealed in the righteousness of Jesus. And I must say, in Jesus there is not a hint of sin. Revelation also describes the warrior. Revelation 12 and verse 9, here it is. So the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, and what does he do? Who deceives how much of the world? The whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. After Satan and his angels sinned, the battle didn't end. They turned the earth into the battlefield. Ever since Satan was kicked out, ever since his angels were expelled, the earth has become the battlefield. It's like after a baseball game. The young guys that go to the baseball game, the baseball doesn't end for them. They go home and play stickball. After the basketball game, the basketball game doesn't end for them. They go home and play basketball. I remember growing up and watching the New York Knicks play on television. Even in the winter, even in the snow, we all get together, the guys in the neighborhood, we'd get a snow shovel, go to the park, shovel the snow, and play basketball in freezing cold weather. The point of the matter is, you don't need an indoor arena to play basketball. You don't need heaven for that to be the battlefield. The earth is the battlefield of today. Satan is down here. His angels have fallen. And when they fell, they became the demons to carry on the battles from age to age. Satan uses his angels to organize the world into the final coalition. Look at Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. The Bible says, For they are spirits of demons. Just think about that for a moment. Demons performing signs or miracles which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So there are demons working as we're sitting here. There are demons in every facet of society. There are demons everywhere in the earth. As there are angels, as the Holy Spirit is working on the hearts of all humanity, there are demons opposing the advancement of truth at every hand. But I want to say this, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Can you say amen to that? So I'm not fearful of the demons. I'm just so glad that the Lord has told us that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. This is a real war. We are really living in the final battle, soon to be followed by the battle of Armageddon. But tonight... I want to say this and understand this very clearly. There is a final coalition 
not talking about the Christian coalition, not talking about any other earthly coalition. There is a final coalition that will be formed, and not until all seven systems are in place that the final battle is going to begin. The Bible reveals seven systems through which Satan has continued to work from age to age. How many systems did I say? Seven. Seven is a complete number. And by the way, you're not going to find this in, a, in one particular passage in the Bible. I've done my homework to find this one. As a matter of fact, you may not have heard this ever presented before. This may be the first time you're going to hear about these seven systems. I'm not talking about seven kings. I'm not talking about Rome and all of its phases. I'm talking about from the very time that Satan entered this earth until the very end, he has established seven systems through which he works. Not talking about the seven heads and ten horns. Not that at all. Seven systems introduced into the Bible. But in those systems, there are two main ways he works. One is destruction. The other is deception. Those are the only methods he uses. Let's observe the introduction of the first of the seven systems. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Are you ready to follow? Here we go. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more cunning or subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The first system was introduced in the garden. I'll tell you what that was in a moment. But the first thing that Satan did to lay the foundation for the first system was what he's still doing today. He got Eve to question whether or not God really said what God said. So the questioning of God's word did not begin just in the evangelical world or just when all these books I talked about last night came out. This began in the Garden of Eden. The oldest tactic Satan has used in all the ages is to question whether or not God's word really says what God's word says. He led Eve to believe that there are no negative consequences to ignoring the word of God. That's why tradition is exalted today. People, I remember once, and I, I'm not going to tell many stories tonight, but this fits right here. I remember one day a member of our church said he looked in his pastor's Bible or saw his pastor's Bible opened out at the Bible study or in the pulpit, and he saw a lot of places in the Bible highlighted in yellow. And he thought, my pastor's really a man that studies. And he asked his pastor, what are those highlights in his Bible about? And his pastor said, in seminary, they told him to highlight those verses because those are verses that they did not want him to preach from when he began his ministry. Seminaries are also being used in our world to sow seeds of error. So whether a person is in a seminary or not, if you are in Christ and being led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? And can you say amen to that? So the Holy Spirit is the active agent leading people to understand the word of God. You can be in a seminary, but if they're not telling the truth, you're just an educated liar. And there's nobody more dangerous than a person that knows how to use his lies. Education with a lie behind it is a dangerous tool. There's nobody more intellectual than Satan, by the way, except God. Satan also convinced Eve that sin does not lead to death. Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5. Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. People today believe that people are dead, but not surely. That's why folk wouldn't go to the cemetery at night. Let me submit to you, the cemetery is one of the safest places in any major city. <laughs> Nobody's going to, you could get a, you could get a towel, go lay in the cemetery, put your money all around you in New York, and nobody will come after you and rob you. Amen. I know that's to be true. That's the truth. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. God's holding out on you, for God knows, verse 5, that in the day you eat of it, that is, disobey God, your eyes will be open. Disobedience does not lead to your eyes being open. It leads to your eyes being shut. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Yes, they did know good and evil, but what they knew was not what they wanted to know. Sometimes we get to know good and evil, and we want to forget the evil we know and find out more of the good that we should know. So evil is not a good thing to know. God did not intend for Adam and Eve to understand death and sin and suffering and pain. Yes, they did know good and evil, but not what God intended for them to know. 
Here's a powerful quotation from the book, Darkness Before Dawn. My favorite author, I believe that God inspired Ellen White so that her words resonate like they were just written. Listen to what she says. The only one who promised Adam life in disobedience was the great deceiver. And the declaration of the serpent to Eve in Eden, you shall not surely die, was the first sermon ever preached upon the immortality of the soul. Yet this declaration, resting solely upon the authority of Satan, is echoed from the pulpits of Christendom and is received by the majority of mankind as readily as it was received by our first parents. You can hear the lies. When people die, everybody, the news says it, preaches lie from the pulpit. He's in heaven now looking down on us. No, he's not. He's right there in the coffin. What's not being preached nowadays is the resurrection. What's the purpose of the resurrection? For Jesus to come back and resurrect his saints. Amen. That's not being preached. You don't hear anything about the resurrection. Just dying and going to heaven. Now let me tell you something. If death was an entrance to heaven, death would not be an enemy. It would be a friend. But it's an enemy. And the reason why we cry is because the Lord has put within us something to understand that death is an enemy. We don't rejoice at funerals and say, oh, I'm so glad my mother died, now she's in heaven. We don't say that. But, but preachers lie. I don't even want to say untruth. I want to call it what it is. Preachers lie, and they do it intentionally. And that's what the church did during the Dark Ages. That's how they raised up their cathedrals in Europe. They lied to the people. They, they taught purgatory to people that, who had parents that did not get baptized before they died. They raised millions, the Catholic Church did during the Dark Ages, and raised up their cathedrals with that lie. Then they taught another lie, limbo, for babies that did not get baptized. That's why babies are baptized in the Catholic Church. They said they, they are in purgatory now, they're in limbo, but I can get them out if you pay me. They also taught the sin of indulgences, and I'll talk about more of that later on in the sermon. But the foundation for deception today, the very first system, whether you caught it or not, the very first system established in the Garden of Eden is the system of spiritualism. What did I say? Spirit, the oldest thing that Satan has used, spiritualism throughout the ages, from the Garden of Eden until Jesus comes, spiritualism will be active. Ellen White says in the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, listen to what she says, page 235. The doctrine of the natural immortality of the soul has opened the way for the artful working of Satan through modern spiritualism. That whole series I did on the occult, spiritualism is everywhere. It's everywhere. I'm not going to take the time tonight. If you haven't heard that series called Unclean Spirits, you need to get it. Spiritualism is everywhere, in everything. And what does it mean by the natural immortality of the soul? People believe that the soul goes on and on and on. That's the reason why people believe that their dead ones are in heaven. That's the platform for the veneration and worship of Mary and other saints that are really dead. The afterlife is portrayed in movies and television, and that's all born in spiritualism. Spiritualism is the basis for the New Age movement and Eastern mysticism. Spiritualism is the door to seances and mediums and witches and warlocks. Spiritualism is the entrance into the occult and devil worship. It's been going on for 6,000 years. But what was introduced in the Garden of Eden will reach its full development in the last days. Listen to what Ellen White says. Same book, sorry, Darkness Before Dawn, page 23, paragraph 3. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. Notice the word final. Little by little he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full, the full accomplishment of his design but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. We are living in the last remnant of time, are we not? That's right. He's laid the foundation a long time. His final effort, that's why my series has the word final in every message. Spiritualism is the oldest of the seven systems, and it will be a part of the Battle of Armageddon, the first contributor to the final coalition. But now let's go to the second system. This one was introduced shortly before the flood. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 gives us the entrance into this system. And the Bible says, 
Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil how? Continually. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 91, paragraph 1. In the days of Noah, a double curse was resting upon the earth in consequence to Adam's transgression and of the murder committed by Cain. You know, Cain killed Abel. God bestowed upon these antediluvians many and rich gifts, but they used his bounties to glorify themselves and turned them into a curse by fixing their attention upon the gifts instead of the giver. Not desiring to retain God in their knowledge, they soon came to deny his existence. Men put God out of their knowledge and worshiped the creatures of their own imagination, and as the result, they became more and more debased. This second system removes God from the picture. Here's how Paul says it in Romans 1 and verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. This second system that was introduced, not at its fulfillment yet, not at its full strength, the second system that was introduced is what we now call modern atheism. The removal of God, what do you call a system and a society that pushes the knowledge of God out of its civilization? You call it atheism. That's what happened to the communists. That's what happened in Russia. That's what happened in France in 1798. They outlawed God. Let me tell you something. You can pass laws, but you can't get rid of God. What do you say? It was introduced. It did not reach its fulfillment. That's what made France so diabolical. Atheism was, the, atheism was the power that Satan organized to lead them to outlaw God's word in 1798. But atheism was in existence thousands of years before France did that. The Great Controversy, 1888, page 269, paragraph 2. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. This is atheism, what Egypt did long before France. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a spirit of unbelief and defiance. Atheism is alive in our world today and growing in America. You know what they're saying? That we have religious freedom, and they're using religious freedom to introduce all kinds of systems against the government of God. Atheism was the seed of communism. God is being expelled out of American society. Look at some of the things that we had when we were young that we don't have any longer. For example, the phrase, in God we trust, while still being on the dollar bill, atheists challenged that. They said that's anti-religious freedom. So get rid of in God we trust and something else being resisted in America. When you say one nation under God, atheists stand up and, and protest that. Prayer in high schools at their graduations, prayer at schools, sporting events are being protested once again by atheists. I heard on the news just a few weeks ago a young man whose friend died in a car accident, 16 years old. He was playing a football game, and when he hit the winning touchdown or, or ran for the winning touchdown, he pointed to the sky in a gesture somewhat, so to speak, in his own mind, contributing the win to his friend. You know what happened? He was reprimanded for doing that, for pointing to the sky. They said that was a religious gesture. That's, what's hap that's how ridiculous it's getting in America. God is being put out. A man by the name of Edward Kagan, he's an atheistic leader, he says he has started something called the American Religious Civil War. There's a picture I want to show you right now. It's ridiculous. I can't tell you a whole lot about it, but this picture, this is a picture of something called de-baptism. You heard what I said? You heard it right. De-baptism. This is a de-baptism certificate. I blocked the name out for obvious reasons. There's a movement in America appealing to Christians to leave Christianity, and he stands up in this movement with a, with a grim reaper's cloak on, a cloak over his head, and a big old blow dryer, and in a ceremonial sense, he has those who want to be de-baptized walk down the line, and he blow dries them to symbolize he's removing all the water of baptism. 
de-baptism in America. It's ridiculous, but look it up on the internet. There's so many responses to that, so many people registering in. Time Magazine did the expose and they recorded the videos. There's about 15 videos on de-baptism. Isn't that ridiculous? But you know what the atheists said? They said Christians shouldn't get upset by that. Because if their Christianity is secure, what we do should not make them feel insecure. I'm not insecure, I'm just telling you how Satan is working in America. Here's a picture of one of his followers, hat on a shirt. This girl used to be a Christian, she gave up her Christianity, and here's the shirt that she wear. There's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Well, she's in trouble if she had to use the word probably. If you're not sure that God does not exist, that's not the shirt you need to wear, am I right? Probably, well that means there's a chance. But that's what's happening in America. Let's go to the third system. This system of atheism will be in the final coalition. The third system that we will introduce is one that was born on the heels of a nation that rejected its Savior. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 to 38. Praise the Lord, I'm moving at a good pace and I so appreciate the guys in the truck and the entire crew. Thank you guys, thank you ladies. Matthew 23, verse 37 and 38. This third system is Judaism, modern Judaism. First, spiritualism, then atheism, then Judaism. Listen to what Jesus said about the nation that rejected him. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, and here's what he said, your house, whose house? Your house, not his house. Your house is left unto you desolate. According to JewsForJudaism.org, and I did my research, I'm giving you snippets. If you want to have fun and do the homework, you can. They say, these are Jews for Judaism, they say that Jesus is not the true Messiah. They use a word in the Hebrew, ha-mashiach. They said Jesus, the word Messiah in Hebrew or in Greek does not read that way, so therefore Jesus cannot be the true Messiah. They say the true Messiah must be a descendant of King David, and Jesus does not fit that. They said Jesus' father was a descendant, but not Jesus. Isn't that amazing? They said a literal Elijah must come, not someone preaching the Elijah message. That's the third reason they reject the divinity of Jesus. They also say the Old Testament prophets do not predict a second coming. Well, it's all through the Old Testament, the second coming of Jesus. Amen? But they said because there is no second coming, the second coming, the Jews for Judaism.org says, the second coming is a desperate attempt to explain away the failures of Jesus. Judaism, which God established to be a blessing, has now become a curse in the earth because they've rejected the very one that wanted to use them to carry the gospel to the world. Judaism is that third system. But look at what 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says. The foundation for our safety is accepting Jesus and that he came in the flesh. John says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and what else, friends? An antichrist. So the system that God established and called to be a light to the world, they rejected Jesus in, in Acts chapter 13, verse 42 to 46. He said, it was necessary that the word of God should first be given to you. But seeing that you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, when they heard that, the Bible says they rejoiced. And I want to say today, Jesus is the Savior. What do you say? Regardless of who says otherwise. And what they did to cover it up is recorded in Matthew 28, verse 13. They could not accept the fact that Jesus rose again. But I tell you today, the reason I'm preaching this way is I serve a risen Savior who's soon returning to take us home. Here's the lie they spun, Matthew 28, verse 13. When they heard about the resurrection of Jesus, they called the Roman soldiers together, and they spun a lie, and they said to the soldiers, tell them... That is, the Roman leaders tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Tell them that. What did the Roman soldiers do? Verse 15 of Matthew 28. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. But let me tell you something. Jesus had a plan to make sure that people knew he was raised. 
he was seen by more than 500 people. Amen, someone. So he didn't rely on the Roman soldiers to get the news out. He told Mary, go tell the disciples I'm risen. Go tell Peter, the one that denied me, the one that I'm going to forgive. Tell him I'm risen. And on the day of Pentecost, a risen and a resurrected God was firing up Peter, the apostle, now forgiven. And he called the Jews that finally understood Jesus is the Messiah. He called them to repentance. Jesus is alive and well today. What do you say? The system that rejected its own savior will be in the final coalition. There's an entire world filled of Jews, filled with Jews, looking for the coming of the Messiah when in fact he's coming a second time, not with sin, but for the purpose of taking us home. Let's go to the fourth system now. The fourth one that will be included in the final coalition. This system was introduced on the basis of demoting Jesus. This fourth system is Islam. Go with me to Genesis chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. The first one, spiritualism. The second one, atheism. The third one, Judaism. And the fourth one, Islam. Genesis chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Notice what the Bible says. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him. How, friends? Exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Right now, Islam is all over the world. It's the fastest growing segment of religious society. It's the fastest growing population in the world, period. The Muslim population. But notice verse 21. He says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. God made a covenant with Isaac. What do you say? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then the 12 sons of Israel. God has a nation today that serves him, not demotes him, but let me give you some facts about Islam just so that we can be more educated because they don't totally deny Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus is mentioned 25 times more in the Quran than Muhammad is. Belief in Jesus is required in Islam and required to be a Muslim. They teach that Jesus is a messenger from God to guide the children of Israel, but they also say, as is every other messenger from God. Islam teaches that Jesus was a Muslim. Islam teaches the virgin birth of Jesus. But Islam does not accept Jesus as being incarnate God, and they don't accept the fact that he was the Son of God. Islam also teaches that in the judgment, they say, Jesus will deny having ever claimed divinity. They all also say that Jesus was not crucified, but he was taken to heaven, and they say Jesus did not atone for our sins. And let me say you, they say this, anyone whose sins are not atoned for by Jesus will be in the final coalition. What do you say? Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the what stone? Chief cornerstone. But Dr. Luke says, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The only one that can give us salvation is Jesus. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. So when I pray my prayers, I say, in Jesus' name I pray. I come to the Father in the name of Jesus. He is alive. He did atone for our sins. He was crucified. He is sitting at the right hand of Father, and he is very much divine. But the fifth system, the fifth system to be included in the final coalition, this is a powerful one. I'm I, you know, the reason why this pulses with me is because most of my, my, well, most of my family members are under, are under the delusion of this system. So I'm talking to generations. I'm talking to generations of family. I'm talking to generations that I want to see in the kingdom. This is personal to me. I'm talking to those who love the Lord, but who have had their eyes closed by tradition that has resonated from generation to generation. The fifth system that is a part of the final coalition is a system born on the basis of 
complete deception. And I think you've already guessed which one it is, Catholicism. Established during the Dark Ages, we'll talk about that tomorrow morning, how they got established, how they got to where they are today. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm going to talk about the means and the methods that Satan has used to establish in that system all of the deception that is working on the hearts of 1.3 billion people today. And I want to preface this. What I'm about to say is not against any person, it's against a system. But I'm also going to say, if you get upset, check it out. Do your homework. The only reason why you should get upset is because you don't want to look it up. But if you want truth, you're about to get it. I'd rather you get upset with me telling the truth than all, both of us laugh our way all the way to hell. Matter of fact, Paul the Apostle, when he was opposed by some of the leaders in the New Testament, he says, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A wise man by the name of Solomon said that. So the wounds that come as a result of telling the truth are wounds that will lead us to finding the truth. Catholicism established itself on the basis of man as the mediator between God and us. And so the question is, why confess to a sinful man when Jesus is our sinless mediator? Look at what Timothy says. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Why call an earthly man father and pray our father which art in heaven? Does it make sense? It's not even consciously clear. Why say, Father, when we pray our Father which art in heaven? It gives you not only his designation and who he is, but where he's located, in heaven. But listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 23 and verse 9. Jesus made it very clear. He says, and call no man your father. He was speaking in the ecclesiastical sense, not in the parent parental sense. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is where? In heaven. Why kneel before an earthly priest when the Bible says in Hebrews 8 and verse 1, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That's where our priest is. A sinless priest. Amen. Amen. Not someone that has to atone for his sins and then try to atone for mine. My sins are atoned for and yours are atoned for by the blood of a spotless lamb and a spotless mediator. But let's keep going. Why pray to people that are dead? Why pray to saints that are no longer alive to intercede for us when Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, speaking of Jesus, he is able to... He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since, and I want you to say this with me, with me, since he always lives to do what, friends? To make intercession for them. We have an intercessor that's always alive. He's not in a city in, on the earth, but he's in a city in heaven. He's confessing our names before the Father as we confess his name before those on the earth. Why pray to images? Oh, there's a text I almost forgot. I don't want to go past it because you can't pray to the dead. Isaiah 8 and verse 19 says, should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Absolutely not. Let me tell you something. I, I saw the factory where those saints are made. It's just melted plastic and somebody sits down and paints them very classically. It's their job. That plastic is not going to help you in an accident. And I hope you don't feel that I'm disrespecting you but I'm telling you the truth. The only help you're going to get in an accident is Jesus. His holy angels will guide the hand of the steering wheel to keep you from something that could possibly happen. Not a plastic idol on your screen, not a, not a crystal like the New Ages do, not something that's made by the hands of man. Isaiah said they have eyes, but they can see ears, but they cannot hear. But let's continue. Why pray to images when it's forbidden in the Bible? Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. Notice what the Lord says. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image. 
any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth and here's the reason why you shall not bow down to them nor what serve them for I the Lord your God am a what kind of God a jealous God worship belongs to God and to God alone Amen. well men like worshiping things so Satan set up an entire system of worship. You look at the Old Testament prophets, this existed in their day. Elisha was given the job of tearing down all the altars established by the false kings. In the days of many of the kings, those who were Philistines and Amorites and, and Jebusites and, and, and Hittites, they set up sometimes their altar right next to the altar of God, and that's alive today. That's why the Bible says, Paul says, there's spiritual wickedness in high places. When you look that word up, high places, you have to go to the Old Testament because the phrase high places meant the groves where false worship took place right next to the altar of God. That's the high places. Not just some ethereal place in heaven, but spiritual wickedness closely aligned right next to the place where God should be worshipped. That's why Isaiah 42 and verse 8 says as follows, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Is that clear? But Catholicism hasn't stopped there. They teach that people die and are in heaven right away. That's not in the Bible. They teach that the soul is immortal. That's not in the Bible. They teach that there is an eternally burning hell. That's not in the Bible. That was another way of raising money during the Dark Ages. It's amazing what happened during the Dark Ages, but the reason why it's called the Dark Ages is because the light of God's truth was extinguished. It was hidden from the common man. We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning, about the Protestant Reformation, how God's number one aim is to open the eyes of the blind to set at liberty those who are captives. The recovering of the sight, and one of the conditions the Bible outlines in the last days is this. Wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And you know what? Don't even know it. So there are people worshiping, don't even know their condition because they are hired, they are under the leadership and under the mesmerism of men that have them doing things that are not supported, not even in the Bible anywhere. But let's continue. Catholicism teaches that babies can be baptized. How can a baby be baptized when a baby doesn't even understand commitment? A baby just wants a bottle, and his diaper has changed. Catholicism ordained Sunday as a holy day. And you know what? They tell you that. It's not in the Bible. What's so sad about it is Protestant leaders, evangelicals, try to find scriptures in the Bible to support that. And the ones who set it up, I'm going to show you this tomorrow morning, the ones that set up the worship and honor and the veneration of Sunday, they tell you they did it. And all these leaders that want to hold on to tradition because you know why? You can go to church for an hour and it's becoming the same sickness in the Adventist church. One hour in church and the rest of the day piddling around doing unholy things on God's holy day. I'm going to hit that on the head tomorrow like a man driving in a stake into a train rail. Because what we, are, what we are doing is we're going down the same road, we're following the trends and patterns of the secular society of Christianity and beginning to live like them. The same lethargy exists in the Adventist church. Disrespect for the truth when it's being preached. Why give God an entire day? You know, friends, it's not about giving God an entire day. It's about giving God your entire heart. Amen. If God has your heart, What's a day? A day is nothing when he has your heart. Matter of fact, I love when our anniversary comes. Everybody's on hold. My wife and I spend the entire day together. I don't hesitate to say this weekend is our anniversary. We won't, we won't be around. Well, God has a weekly quote-unquote anniversary. But just for the sake of gaining access to, the, access to the pagans, Rome took the day that they already worshipped, the sun day, baptized it and gave it to Christianity and you'll find out tomorrow all the claims they tell it to you in black and white and you see those things tomorrow morning Catholicism also teaches its members to pray the rosary it's forbidden in the Bible Matthew 6 and verse 7 and when you pray Jesus said do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do for they think that they will be heard for their much or their many words 
Catholicism teaches its followers to pray Hail Mary, not Hail King Jesus. They say that Mary is full of grace. God is full of grace. How can someone who is dead be full of grace? Mary was just a woman like anybody else, but she was chosen by God to be the mother through whom Jesus came. And on that very same note, God was her father. She is not God's father. Asking Mary to pray for sinners. Listen to what Jesus says. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am what else, friends? The truth, and I am what else? The life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We go through Jesus. You may have seen the picture of Jesus like this. One hand stretched up to God, the other hand stretched down to man. He brings mortal man in touch with an immortal God. He brings an immortal God in touch with mortal man. He is the bridge between humanity and divinity. Not Mary. And when you look at the hierarchy, God, Mary, then Jesus. And during the Dark Ages, a poem was put together to teach children that Mary was more supreme than God. Some of us said it. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. The lamb was following Mary. Catholicism put that together. So during the Dark Ages, kids could say that and get used to Mary being the leader of the lamb. I don't tell you this. The lamb is the leader of Mary. Can you say amen? Clever, clever. Mary had a little lamb. No, the little lamb had Mary. That's the beauty of the incarnate God. He created the one through whom he came into the world. That's too deep to even understand right now. But it's sad that Catholicism was able to teach that. You know why? Because they exalted during the Dark Ages, during the Council of Trent. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. Don't miss it. During the Council of Trent, they exalted tradition on the same level and even above the Bible. You'll see how exactly they did that. So nowadays, they can slide that in and say, oh, that's tradition, and it's blessed. Any tradition that is against the Word of God is not blessed. Anything that removes from God's Word a thus saith the Lord is not blessed. It cannot be blessed. Matter of fact, Jesus said in, John, in Matthew 15 and verse 3, I use the NIV for this one. Jesus replied, and he said, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Which is just tradition. Not all traditions are bad. You heard the story about the lady that every Thanksgiving, and I don't eat ham, but the story fits because every time she'd cook a ham, she'd cut off one inch of the ham and put it in the pot. You heard the story, many of you heard the story, maybe you heard the story before, but it's significant, it fits right here. And her husband said, honey, why do you cut off an inch from the ham before you bake it? She said, because my mother did. Well, being puzzled by that, she called him and said, mom, why do you cut off an inch of the ham before you bake it? I should use something else, a inch of, an inch of the wham before you bake it. <laughs> why do you do that before you bake it? And she said, because my... My mother did, and thankfully the grandmother was still alive, and she called her mother and said, Mom, why do you do that? And she said, oh, honey, it was simple. It was just too big for the pan. <laughs> and there are people that are doing things, and they think it's blessed, and there's something mystical about it. It's simply, it's simply tradition. Tradition is not the basis of salvation. Whatever happened to the Word of God? You know what's amazing to me is nowadays there are more Bibles accessible than any other time in human history. You can get Bibles on the iPad, iPod, on the PC, on the Mac. You can get on your small uh, smartphone and your smart devices. Bibles are everywhere. They're sold by the millions all over the world. It's still the number one best-selling book. Every translation, simple English, children's Bible, old English. But this is the most biblically ignorant age in human history because tradition has taken center stage. I think you see it why I take this seriously. There are people that are held bound in darkness tonight because of some of these things. But I'm asking you, if you fall into any one of these categories I've talked, to, I've talked about so far, check it out. If you think I'm making it up, contact me, 3abn.org. I will be glad. We have an entire staff of pastors who would love to lead you and guide you. Tradition is the reason many people are going to lose their salvation. 
But if you follow a plain, thus saith the Lord, you can't follow the map and end up in Canada when the map leads you to California. The Word of God is reliable. It's also sharper than any two-edged sword. It will cut up error no matter where it finds it. Get back to the Bible. You know what happened nowadays, and I have a little bit more time than I have, and I, and I thank the Lord I was able to get through these very important points. I didn't forget I have one more system. Didn't forget. But I need to say this. All this instant information is robbing the study of the Bible. Things are happening so fast. A commercial changes every three to four seconds. So people think that the Bible should change every three to four seconds. And when it doesn't, the word of the 20th, 21st century is bored. People are going to be lost because they were bored. So bored they couldn't read the only way out. Bored. It's just one book. Add up all the movies you've seen and all the songs you've listened to, all the filth you've read on the internet. The only map to get you out of the hole. Boring. Well, I like my boring Bible. Amen, somebody. And by the way, it's not boring. It's a pleasurable book. Whenever my life is down and, and out, this is the only book that brings me satisfaction. All that other stuff is transient. It evaporates. It's like paper that you drop in a fire. It blows away. But the Word of God, people have tried to get rid of the Word of God. It's the anvil that has worn out many hammers of the centuries. It still lasts today. Any system that's built on tradition, any time a tradition conflicts with the Bible, the Bible is the final authority. System number six. And by the way, I'm not going to talk about system number seven tonight. I'm going to talk about that one tomorrow. That requires an entire topic because it's the last one. It's the last of the seven. And as I said earlier, when all seven systems are in place, then we will know that we are living in the end time. Because this last system I'm going to talk about tomorrow could not exist at any other time other than the last days. That's exactly the way the Bible unfolded it to exist. But let's look at system number six. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this one because this one is so obvious. It's like the nose on your face. The sixth system that is a deceptive system. And by the way, every system I mentioned tonight is built on deception. But I said that Satan has two methods. What are they again? Deception and destruction. He has used deception from the Garden of Eden till now, which means he res he's reserving destruction for the final battle of Armageddon. All guns blazing. Destruction. Seeking to destroy seeking whom he may devour. He's going to pull the gloves off. He's waiting for the final battle, and he's rearing up today. But the last of the, the sixth system of the seven is secularism. What did I say? Secularism, secular humanism, all these philosophies. Everybody want to sound intellectual. You can say a whole lot of nothing. We have an entire society based on washing out the mind. Let me tell you something. When people come, the Bible talks about that as uh, philosophy and vain deceit. Here's a summarization of the system of secularism. Simply as the Bible puts it. 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17. The Lord says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love two things. For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, secularism, the lust of the eyes, look at Las Vegas, New York, all these cities of light and vice, and the pride of life. Everybody wants to be top and best and talked about and praised. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Secularism. Everybody just wants to have fun. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides, how long, friends? Forever. You know what? There's nothing better than having fun and going to bed without feeling that you offended God. There's a, ple there's a lot of pleasure being a Christian. The devil makes it seem like, can't you eat anything in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, I could eat it. Get this, God gave Eve every single tree but one. God... Gave us a whole lot of room. And the reason why the people of the world cannot love God is because they love the world. 
No one can serve two masters. They make no room for Jesus. But I want to say tonight as I close, in the midst of all these systems I've mentioned so far, they make no room for Jesus. No room for God. Don't have time for God. It's like giving a dog a chicken bone and after you've sucked the marrow out of it, he looks at it and says, what, what am I going to do with that? No room for God. No value in their lives. It's sad to go to your deathbed without any hope. There are people that need to have Jesus in their lives. Let me encourage you, no matter how bad the picture looks, there is still a system that God has established, and he says, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's a system that's not going down. The economy is going down. The job market is going down. The stock market is going down. Chrysler and Ford and GM and all the other foreign cars are going to be going down. Real estate going down, it's all going down. But the Lord says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It's going up. Amen. Songwriter said, people get ready, there's a train a coming. I'm getting on that train. Anybody else here tonight? Friends, let me encourage you. I'm talking about the truth. If you want to get on the train to truth, the train is found in God's word. It is the, it is the conductor that is going to get us there. It is his word that is going to be our guide. Tonight, I'm going to pray that God will lead you and guide you to, to turn off all the things that are pulling you away, get out of the systems of darkness, and get on board with the conductor of light as he leads us to that eternal kingdom. Let's pray tonight. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that the truth is clear it's too clear. We're not living in a dark age. This is not the age of ignorance, but this is the age of light. Yet darkness is pervading every facet of society. Sadly enough, even the minds of many Christian homes and the pulpits of many places around the world. But tonight we thank you for the light that comes through Jesus. Bless it, secure it, preserve it, that in this dark hour someone will find Jesus. And in your precious name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Central Time, the message is the final apostasy. Then 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, the final act. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you then.